Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. And today I want to talk about perhaps a sensitive subject about staying sexually pure. So uh, keep tuned. Uh, Matthew 5.8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The implication is that if we are not pure, that will open the door to deception in our life. And the main area people find the greatest challenge to maintain purity is in the area of sex. And it's also the area in which they're least likely to talk about or bring to the light because there's a special shame associated with sexual sin. In fact, for many people, their greatest victory would be to find and maintain sexual purity. So, uh, you know, I might be talking to you, and if you, there's more than one person listening, just, just look straight ahead at the TV, don't blink. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are, have a challenge in this area. Why is it connected with shame? Uh, why, wh why is sexual sin connected with shame? It's a, there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt has to do with what you have done. Um, the opposite of guilt is to be righteous. But shame is to do with who you are. And the opposite of that is honor. Honor is to do with what, who you are. Are you honorable? Or if you have done something that, that diminishes you in who you are, then that is the sense of shame. And so shame goes to the very core of who you are, and it can rob us of our intimacy with God. And it, shame is the feeling or the belief that you have no worth as a person. And it's not just that you're guilty that you've done something wrong, it goes deeper than that, that you have lost your worth. And that deeply inhibits your ability to have an intimate relationship with God and receive from God. And you can't overcome shame by good works. That's like just trying to put uh, an elastoplast over a deeper problem. Um, only the blood of Christ, actually, can, can restore our honor once we have that shame. And Jesus, you see, when he died on the cross, he was naked. He took, didn't just took our guilt, he took our shame. He was naked and he died a humiliating, shameful death. Uh, he took the curse of your shame to, in order to restore honor and value and glory. To your life. Praise God. Well, your own, the only way you can be free from shame is to turn to Jesus and let him take your shame and restore your honor. But if you continue in sexual sin, uh, that will result in, in that sense of shame continuing and deepening in you. Um, the trap that we fall into with sexual sin is that we use it to medicate us against pain in our lives and and even shame that sense of low self-worth and and it gives you those chemicals that are released give you um, a kind of a, a momentary boost and and the, can numb that pain but deep inside the shame only increases because we know we've abused something sacred in us which is our sexuality and We've humiliated ourselves, and so the shame deepens, and, and so it sets up an addictive cycle. And the only hope of breaking free is to really turn to God and really ask for his power and his grace to be free there. Well, shame is often is associated with sexual sin in particular, and, and that's why people find it so hard to talk about it. And let's try and understand that by going right back to the beginning, the original union of Adam and Eve, man and woman, sets the pattern. Genesis 2, it says, Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, Now, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, in this pattern, according to this pattern, um, the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh and they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So shame is even mentioned right at the beginning when it talks about the, the relationship between a man and a woman. But when it's done right, 
in the context of marriage, it says they were not ashamed. There is no shame there because it's as God ordained it. And notice they become husband and wife first, and then they became one flesh, which is a reference to sexual union. In such a case, there is no shame. And so it's interesting that shame is written right at the start. The implication is that when it isn't done according to God's way, then sexual sin brings shame. The, the abuse of sex results in shame and dishonor. And we see this in the other verse, in Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable. There's that word honor. It's honorable among all. And the bed of marriage, which is talking about sex, is undefiled. In other words, there is no shame uh, because it's within the covenant relationship of marriage. Then there is no shame, only honor. But fornicators and adulterers, it says, God will judge. So, in other words, sex is sacred. Otherwise, it couldn't be defiled. You can only defile something that's sacred. Um, sexual impurity, which is the, the abuse of our sexuality, is the word porneia. That's where we get the word pornography from. And this is translated fornication. It's kind of old-fashioned word. But it simply means sexual immorality, sex outside the marriage covenant. And, and adultery in particular is a specific and serious example of, the most serious example, really, of porneia. God takes sexual sin seriously because sex is something sacred. If it wasn't sacred, then it wouldn't be a big deal. But in fact, it's the most holy thing in our earthly life. The intimate relationship between um, and uh, a husband and wife is the most holy thing the highest thing in our earthly life. And that's why its abuse incurs shame. From the beginning, God intended it, as we saw in Genesis 2, within the context of marriage. And it's a, the physical expression of the couple's covenant committed love to each other. It's not meant to be outside of that. It's the physical expression of their covenant love. And so without a covenant, it, it, it's being abused. So the world's view of sex outside marriage is, is so wrong and it's destructive and it brings shame. What makes sex so holy? I believe it's to do with the fact that the loving emotional and the sexual intimacy within marriage between a man and a woman comes the closest on earth to actually us fulfilling our nature and our purpose as the image of God. That amazing statement that God made man in his image. Yes, individually we're in his image, but the highest form of being the image of God is actually within marriage. Let me explain that. It's stated in uh, Genesis 1. Then God said, let us, notice the plurality of God, the Godhead, let us make man in our image. So this image of God, though God is one, he is also three. Our image. And so we, as solitary individuals, cannot fully express the image of God because we don't have that plurality. It says, according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So notice, only together, male and female in union actually are a much better expression, a higher expression of the image of God. Because as the father and son are united together in a union of love through the Holy Spirit, so God's plan is for a man and a woman to be united in one, again, th in love, through God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the go-between God. He is the one between the man and the woman. The love that flows between him is in the Holy Spirit. And so again, you have this earthly picture of, a, of the Trinity. It's the man, the woman, and the Holy Spirit. Three and yet they're one, and they are a picture, an image of the Trinity. So this is the highest, uh, and of course sex is part of that whole thing, and that is the highest uh, state of mankind.
in the image of God. And so man and woman, united in love through God's Spirit, an intimacy first of all of heart, and then it's expressed and magnified, this unity through the sexual union. By the way, I think this explains why the sons of God in Genesis 6 were tempted into sexual relationships with human women um, in order to, and then they created these Nephilim. Uh, some of you are wondering what I'm talking about, but a lot of you will know. Why would these angels give up their angelic position to become earthbound? What could possibly tempt them? And actually they understood that through that union they, they would enter into a higher state of being that is closer to the image of God that was actually forbidden to them as angels, which God actually gave to man. And so it's a very high honor to attain that higher state through, through marriage. Well, this marriage relationship between a man and a woman is the highest Therefore, it's the highest earthly relationship. It's the image of our relationship with God. And, uh, and so this is another picture that explains why it's so important. That's why Israel was called the wife of Jehovah. And the church is called the bride of Christ. In other words, because it's the highest earthly relationship, it is used to describe, it's the best possible description that can be given of our relationship with the Lord. So it's a very holy thing. When Israel worshipped idols, um, they were called adulteresses because they were violating a marriage covenant. And James actually says to Christians who are in the world, worldly, adulteresses, he says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And so our relationship with God is likened to that relationship. So sexual relationship with your mate in the marriage bed is actually a picture, it's the highest picture that we have in our earthly life of our worship of God in the Holy of Holies. And that's where God impregnates us with his seed, with his word, where we receive his promises that, he, that will be given birth in our lives. We have a spiritual womb, as it were, where we receive God's seed. And so, there's a very close connection between sex and, and worship. And in fact, the, in the wiring of our brains, the sexual center is very close to the worship center. In other words, the part of our brain that gets activated when we're involved in worship is actually quite close to the part where um, the sexual area, because it's, it's close. And so that is why um, when we abuse our sexuality, because of these connections, we abuse our sexuality, we're actually, that is toxic to our intimacy with God. Because, again, the two things are parallel to each other. And if we continue in that wrong sexuality, we have to manage that shame that's being created by emotionally shutting down on the inside, and, or denying, compartment you know, putting things in boxes, hardening our conscience. And all of these ways of handling the shame, they minimize us as people, and they make us less able to enter into a, love, a real love relationship with, a, with another person. And so we're dealing with a very holy thing. And when you desecrate a holy thing, a thing that is used, as it were, to, to, do, to be parallel to the highest relationships, us with God and the relationships within God, when you desecrate a holy thing, it brings a deep shameful consequence that people don't really understand. Why do I feel this, this type of shame? A another scripture that shows this parallel, it says, Do you not know that he who's joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. So any sexual relationship sets up a one flesh. Uh, connection. Then he says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So you see, your relationship with the Lord, that, that one spirit relationship with the Lord, is actually paralleled with um, the relationship between a man and a woman. It, it, the two are pictures of each other. If we violate 
our earthly relationship sexually, it actually has an effect on our fellowship with the Lord. Well, because we are closest to being the image of God in a loving, sexual covenant union, Satan, therefore, specifically attacks mankind at this point because he hates God and he hates God's image and he wants to destroy that. And so Satan's aim is to take our sex drive, which is a powerful thing, and cause us to misdirect it and causing great damage to us and to others and to God's work. And the main way he does that is he takes our sex drive, which and which is designed actually to be given to another person, and then he uses it to turn, turn it into ourselves, to see sex as primarily a means of self-gratification. And this is the world's lie, straight from hell, and we get it through the media all the time. Sex is not for yourself, it's not to pleasure yourself, it is to give pleasure to another person. What is the main purpose of sex if it's not to give pleasure? Why did God make it so pleasurable? And let's go back to Genesis. It says, the Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, a helper is not an inferior because actually one of the names of God is helper. It, it means someone who's complementary, somebody who completes him. And so Adam was made good, but he was not very good. He was alone. He did not express the full image of God himself because God exists as love in loving fellowship in himself. And so the first purpose of creating man and woman, creating man as man and woman, uh, was not for children, although that's important, but it was actually to answer the problem of loneliness. In other words, the purpose of this union is for intimacy. And that's why God made the sex drive so strong and sex pleasurable. Um, it's because God wants us to form a deep, intimate union with a person of the opposite sex so that we can be a, a, a demonstration of the Trinity on earth. Is God's main word for sex no? <laughs> No, of course not. It's, it's God's idea. But it is no, spelled K-N-O-W, because the Hebrew word for sex is that a man knows his wife. Uh, that's Genesis 4.1. It says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So sex is all about the intimate knowledge of another person. It's not just a physical act on its own. Sex is simply an expression of intimacy, heart intimacy between two people who've covenanted to love one another. And so sex is not to be seen as an isolated physical act, an end in itself, but it's the height of intimacy. And because God wants this to create this deep intimacy of love between a couple, he's built in a reward system in, 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 so that chemicals are released in our brain as a result of sexual activity, uh, union. Uh, because our brain is a flexible thing and it, its pathways change. And these chemicals released in sex create memories and new pathways that reshape our brain. The effect of this reward, this emotional reward if you like, is that when two people have sex, they, it strengthens their emotional bond. Their brain pathways are adjusted to each other more, strengthening the bond. And this is all good within marriage. But when people follow the world's advice and just use sex randomly, as it were, to pleasure themselves as they please outside marriage, they're abusing their sex drive and they're actually defiling themselves as a result. And they're creating confusion in their brain pathways. And they're making themselves selfish in their nature. This is the essence of fornication. Whether they're using another person to stimulate themselves or they're just doing it on themselves. Their focus is not on building a relationship. Their focus is not on loving the other person, but their focus is on their own pleasure. They want that, that reward. And so they actually 
as their brain gets rewired by this, they are becoming more self-orientated and less able to truly love another person. That's the trap of pornography and masturbation. True love is when the other person is more important than yourself and you are giving your sexuality as a gift to that other person. And in that process you experience great pleasure. But you are, it, the sex drive is to drive you into loving and being united to the other person. But to abuse sex m makes you defiled and also a more selfish, self-focused person. That's why you can have men of 30 to 70 or whatever age, they may look mature on the outside, but inside they're still adolescents because they're focused on their own pleasure first. The deeper in the addiction you go, the more you are locked into your own fantasy world and the less able you are able to be intimate with a real person. And maturity really is moving away from being inwardly centered to being outwardly focused in loving God and others. And so if you're a single person using pornography, masturbation, you're, or you're addicted to short-term relationships, don't even think about looking for a mate. You, you're simply not ready for heart intimacy. Your brain is wired for your own pleasure, for self-gratification. You're not ready to love someone else. And if you do, it will go wrong. You first of all have to get off that pornography. You have to be off it for a serious length of time so that God can actually rewire your brain. Uh, and, and you have to really dedicate yourself to God for his help to get off. You, you'll need months, possibly a year or two, to actually get your brain cleansed and rewired so that you're actually ready to give yourself rather than just be a taker. And so you need to get into God's presence and ask God to cleanse you and change your brain circuits. And that's what Corinthians is talking about when it says flee sexual immorality. This stuff is so powerful. You have to take very positive action to avoid situations that trigger it. He says, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. But literally, it says, it sins into his own body. And this isn't just talking about STDs, which are greatly increasing right now, but actually you're sinning against your brain because through that wrong sexual activity, you're actually uh, creating uh, selfish circuitry in your brain. And brain scans of people who are on pornography are like people under a strong ad addiction of drugs. And, um, but how, however much you've seen that area, God's grace is greater. But again, notice it says, the, the com committing sexual immorality, you sin into yourself. That which is meant to turn you out to, lo to use to love someone else, it, you turn into yourself. You, you are damaging yourself in who you are. But God, and, and it will diminishes you as a person, but turn to God. It says, if we walk in the light, if we bring it to the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship with God and each other, and it says the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin. Just bring that sin, bring your heart and your brain, as it were, to God, and ask him to cleanse you with the blood of Jesus. Notice again in Genesis it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and wife, and they were not ashamed. And notice they are commanded to be joined to one another. That's primarily uh, emotional, and then they become one flesh. That's physical. And the physical is the expression of the emotional. Um, and people reverse the order, but that's, first of all, you, you cleave, and then you become one flesh. But the, even before that, you have to leave, it says. Leave all other relationships. It's talking about in marriage. Before you're ready for sex, you must have a marriage relationship, and to have that properly, you have to leave. In other words, you have to set the, your marriage partner apart from all other relationships, your first devotion, as it were, is to them. And so even your parents, who you, you love and respect, that relationship has to come under your primary relationship now, which is in marriage. You can't cleave until you leave. You have to leave all other relationships 
and then you have then you can cleave emotionally and then physically with your partner and that's why in the relationship with God we have to turn from idols we have to turn from anything else and put God first um, and anything else is 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 like being unfaithful and so we need to be willing to to leave some cultures make that difficult but you have to put your marriage partner first and then if you've had bad rela immoral relationships in the past you have to cut yourself off from those previous one flesh relationships you've got to those memories and those images imprinted on your circuitry you've got to ask God to cleanse you from all of that before you can be really ready to give yourself fully for another person and so fornication is against God's command God says no because he loves us he knows it will destroy us it will make us lesser people and so it's got negative consequences but also we shouldn't do it because there is a great compensation for being faithful if we are faithful in the area of sexuality we will be free of shame we will be able to have a wonderful intimate relationship with God and we will have a pure heart that is ready to give itself to another person and have a wonderful healthy relationship and so be honest with God Despite the shame, give it to him. Let him take your shame away and ask God to change you and make you new. And if necessary, get, get a friend to help you through this. Don't just bury it. Bring it to the light and God will restore your soul. Hopefully you are encouraged and fired up to really want to praise God like you've never done before. Let me give you some more fuel to add to that fire, which is my eight CD series on praise. This will give you the scripture and the inspiration to really change your life in this way and really come into the fullness that God has for you. Thank you for watching. You can watch more of our teachings on our Oxford Bible Church Roku channel and Derek Walker YouTube channel. You're most welcome to join us at our church services which are every Sunday at 11am and 6pm at Cheney School, Headington, Oxford, OX3 7QH. You can order CDs, DVDs, books and other great products from our online shop at www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk or by calling 01865 515 086.